All right, we're looking at question one here. An analyst wishes to develop an algorithm capable of predicting how much the market will move if there is a sudden spike in inflation. The best approach for this kind of problem is A, supervised learning, B, unsupervised learning, or C, data query. So our problem here is we want to predict a market move, or not just a market move, but how much the market will move. Um, that's our output of the model, and then our input is going to be sudden spikes in inflation or just inflation. Um, so we have a very specific thing problem that we want to solve for. Let's look at these um, from C first. So data query, this is when we're just pulling data or information out of some type of database. Um, that's not necessarily going to be helpful um, for developing the algorithm, the predictive algorithm. It might be something we need to use to gather our data, but it's not going to be helpful in the, um, necessarily in that development of the algorithm. Um, B, unsupervised learning. So this is going to be when we just give um, the model a bunch of variables and data and say, here you go, try and find some patterns or correlations between these different variables um, without any specific agenda. But in our case, we want to know a very specific thing. What is the, how much does the market move with sudden spikes and inflation? So we can go ahead and cross off B as well. And we will go with A, supervised learning. This is when we are um, training our model on in-sample data. Uh, so our in-sample data would be those sudden spikes in inflation and then how much the market will move. And then we apply that out of sample um, to determine how predictive that model is in the real world, real world essentially. So we'll go with A. Question two, during a team meeting, Jasmine discusses how to adjust investment strategies based on the current phase of the business cycle. If the economy is entering a slowdown phase, what type of assets should investors most likely consider prioritizing? So I'm going to pull in our uh, business cycle chart. So we are in the slowdown phase for this example. Um, so we're going to be right here. So the slowdown is past this peak. So essentially what this is kind of showing is as we come into our trough, um, expansion this is going to be increase, increase, increase in economic activity. And then their peak is going to be the peak in economic activity. And then slowdown is basically exactly what it says. It's going to be a slowdown in economic activity. So with that in mind, as our economic activity is slowing, let's look at these answers and then we'll determine how that's going to uh, flow through and kind of have an effect on those assets. So A, high risk, high return stocks. So in the slowdown phase, like we said, this is going to mean less economic activity, which is going to translate into lower earnings. And that's especially going to be um, uh, more detrimental for high risk stocks. High risk stocks are generally going to be more leveraged to the economic cycle and they'll be more cyclical. So if they have less earnings growth, um, this is going to lead to or less earnings and or less earnings growth. This is going to lead to bad, worse stock prices, most likely for those companies. Um, so we'll go with A or we'll cross off A. Uh, we probably won't want to prioritize high risk, high return stocks. B, commodities uh, like gold and oil. So commodities could be a bit of a toss up. Um, I mean, gold can often be considered a safe haven and Energy prices um, are somewhat determined by um, are pretty can be a lot determined by the supply, but they're also determined pretty heavily by demand. So oil, energy, um, natural gas, uh, other commodities like copper, these are going to be very sensitive to the demand. And if there's less economic activity, again, there's going to likely going to be less demand, and so um, we're probably not going to be prioritizing. Uh, commodities. So then for C, government bonds and other risk-free assets, um, this will be our answer in that when we're going into that slowdown phase, other riskier assets are going to be hit. So we'll be better off in safe haven assets like government bonds and risk-free assets. C. Question three, what does the following definition best describe? A classification system used to separate the population into smaller groups based on distinguishing characteristics. From each stratum, a random sample is taken and the results are pooled. The size of the samples uh, from each stratum is based on the size of the stratum relative to the population. So we've got A, systematic sampling, B, simple random sampling, or C, stratified random sampling.
So with systematic sampling, um, this is not going to involve separating the population into smaller groups. And when we do systematic sampling, we're going to be um, taking our random sample based on some rule. So maybe every fifth observation or um, something like that, for example. So that doesn't is not what this um, best describes. B, simple random sample. Again, this is also not going to involve separating the population. So we can cross off for that reason. Um, in a simple random sample, observations are going to be randomly selected and all have an equal chance of being selected. Um, but again, the separating population is not part of that. C, that's what we're left with, which is going to be our correct answer, um, which is basically described right here in this paragraph. Question four. You plan to invest $50,000 annually in a stock index for 20 years, assuming that you'll earn 8% per year. The total amount of money you will have at the end of 20 years is closest to. So we are going to be using our calculator here, and we'll be using that time value of money function. And these are the numbers we're going to be plugging in. So let me pull up my calculator. I've already got these plugged in, um, so we'll just take a look here. So we've got... Um, N, we've got 20. Interest rate, we've got 8. Uh, present value, we've got 0. And then payment, um, we've got 50,000. And future value, which is what we're going to compute, we get 228098, which corresponds right there with answer B. Question 5. Which of the following is least likely a limitation of Monte Carlo simulations? So two of these are going to be limitations of Monte Carlo, and one will not be. So A, Monte Carlo simulations are complex to use. So this will not be our answer, since yes, this is a limitation. Um, they're complex. There's a lot of inputs and assumptions that need to be properly input in order to receive a useful output. And then also being able to interpret that output is not always easy. Um, like in the case of financial planning, um, a lot of times software is doing a lot of the work for a financial planner, but the financial planner is the one that understands how to, um, work the software and what the different inputs and assumptions do and whether that's kind of realistic for somebody. Uh, B, Monte Carlo simulation only provides statistical estimates, not the exact results. Uh, this is also going to not be our answer because yes, it is a limitation, um, like we kind of talked about in the first answer, we're inputting a lot of assumptions um, and the simulation is giving us a lot of different um, potential end results as a result of those different assumptions and the volatility of those assumptions, basically. Um, we can't predict the future. No one can predict the future, so we can't get exact results. We'll just have some kind of range or statistical estimates for our output. So that leaves us with answer C. Let's make sure we can go with it. Monte Carlo simulations generate a large number of random samples from probability distributions. Um, this is not a limitation. It's the reason why we use Monte Carlo. Um, it's not easy to do manually. Um, so the simulations, this is not easy to do manually. So the simulations help uh, make that process easier. Answer C. Question six. Which of the following co uh, combination of characteristics would most likely result in a country being considered an autarky. So an autarky is basically um, economic self-sufficiency or striving towards that, um, basically operating independently with little trade between other nations. Um, and so what we kind of need to do is look at which of these factors um, kind of align with that. So A, nationalism and cooperation. So nationalism, yes, this would align with autarky. Um, kind of going hand in hand with autarky is needs to be some pride um, uh, for one's country and wanting to kind of promote one's country versus just getting the cheapest good, cheapest or best goods from elsewhere around the world. Um, so that, that would align with autarky cooperation, though. This does not, um, we're not going to be cooperating with other countries. Um, in an autarky. So we can cross off A. B, nationalism again. So yep, good there. And then non-cooperation. Yep, good there. So uh, looks like B will probably be our answer. 
Uh, C, non-cooperation, good, and globalization, not good. Um, globalization is essentially free trade oriented. Um, so trading a lot with other nations, which we kind of established, is not going to align with our talkie. So we stick with answer B. Question seven, which of the following is most likely an example of an economic tool used by state actors to reinforce cooperative or non-cooperative stances? A, armed conflict. So this is not going to be um, our answer. This is going to be a security tool, not an economic tool. Um, a war or armed conflict can certainly have economic implications during the war and afterward. Um, but it's usually going to be more politically motivated than economically motivated. Um, so we can cross that off. B, World Trade Organization. This is likely going to be our answer. The WTO is an international organization that deals with the global rules of trade before, between organizations and kind of promotes that cooperativeness between them. Um, and that's cooperative in an economic sense. C, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, like armed conflict, this is also going to be a security tool. Um, it's basically an alliance between um, North American countries being the U.S., Canada, and then other uh, Western European countries um, as a military alliance. So we'll stick with answer B. Question eight. Sasha Bale is an analyzing the performance of small cap stocks in an equity index. She is forecasting how stocks will perform relative to the previous quarter in terms of the EPS generated. She performs her analysis using hypothesis testing and rejects the null hypothesis to forecast that sample stocks will generate a higher EPS. Several months later, Bale discovers that the null hypothesis was in fact correct, and her decision was inaccurate. Has Bale committed an error in her statistical analysis? So we've got, um, she rejects the null, uh, but then later finds out that the null was correct. So there is an error here. Um, so we can go ahead and cross off A right away, since we know that yes, there is an error. So now we need to figure out whether there's a type 1 error or a type 2 error. So I'm going to pull in this little table um, that's kind of, this is just kind of something that you want to ingrain, ingrain into your brain. So type 1 error is going to be when we reject a true null, which is what the uh, situation was here. We rejected the null and then it ended up being correct or true. And then type 2 error is going to be failing to reject a false null. Um, so we're going to go with answer B here. And then let me just pull in one more thing here to kind of help demonstrate. So for this to be a type 2 error, the paragraph would kind of have to be changed to look like this. So the null would have to be sample stocks will generate higher EPS, which is what we have. Um, but then we fail to reject the null. And then later on, we discover several months later that the null was false or incorrect. Um, so that's kind of how we would have to change this or what that would look like if it was a type 2 error. Um, but we will go with answer B, type 1 error. Question 9, which of the following statements is least accurate? A, 1% significance level is the same as 99% confidence. So this will not be our answer because this is an accurate statement. Um, confidence level is calculated as 1 minus the significance level. So 1 minus 1% 1 is 99%. B, the alternative hypothesis always includes an equal sign. So this is not going to be accurate. And that's because the alternative hypothesis doesn't have to always equal have an, be an equal sign. It could potentially be greater than, it could potentially be less than, um, or it could be not equal to. It really just all the boils down to what we're kind of um, testing. So it looks like B is going to be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out C. The, alter the alternative hypo hypothesis is usually the hypothesis we are trying to assess. So we can rule that out since that's also accurate. Um, it's the hypothesis that we conclude if there is sufficient evidence to reject the null. Um, so the, uh, it ends up being what we're trying to assess. Answer B. Question 10. Nathan Lewis is planning to subscribe to an investment plan which will generate a 5%, a return of 5% and provide him with $2,000 at the end of each year for the next five years. 
However, due to financial constraints, he plans to subscribe to the investment plan in two years. The present value of the investment plan today is closest to. So we're going to have two steps here. One, we need to figure out the present value of this investment plan. So the present value of the investment plan is going to be pretty straightforward. We'll plug that into our financial calculator. Return will be 5%. Uh, payment of two, minus 2000 um, for five years. So that's going to bring a, give us the present value of that plan. However, um, because we're not starting the plan for two years from now, we're going to need to then discount that present value number back to um, by two more years by this rate of return for two more years. So let me grab the calculator. We'll uh, run through this. So our n is going to be five um, for a number of years. Our i our interest rate is going to be five as well for the rate of return. Our uh, present value is what we'll solve for. So next we'll look at payment, which is gonna be that $2,000, and then our future value is gonna be zero. Um, so we'll compute present value. So we get 8658.95, and this is where it's tricky, because if, if you don't discount back for two more years and you're rushing, you go ahead and see, oh, answer C right there. Um, but the next step we have to take is we go right from here and we're just going to divide, uh, make sure we use our parentheses, and we'll use that 1.05 or that 5% uh, rate, so 1 plus the rate, um, and we'll square it since we're going back two years. And that's going to give us our present value in today's dollars, or in today. Uh, so we get 7853 which gives us answer A.